We are back for episode 33 of the Owl Triangle podcast. And as always, I'm joined by Andy Stevenson and Quilcha de Barham. We are going to take you through all the latest news in Irish mixed martial arts on for what's been a little bit of a barren period for Irish MMA after a hectic start to 2023. We have a little bit of breathing room, but we still have some topics to talk about. No guest today. You're stuck with us, the Three Stooges, for the next hour or so. And we're going to talk a little bit about tough, a couple of upcoming fights. I look back at a certain anniversary of Neil Siri. We have it all. We'll, we'll cover it over the next hour. If you support the podcast, you can support us by hitting the subscribe button, hitting the like button, sharing it with a friend, giving us a five-star review on SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast, if audio is your preference. We do appreciate E8, everybody's love and support when it comes to the Owl Triangle. Lads, how are we doing? Like I was saying, it was um, a little bit of a barren period for Irish MMA. Um, we uh, started off 2023. Um, it was all hell broke loose on Irish MMA, really. That's the only way I could explain it. Uh, a couple of world champions, a couple of fighters breaking up onto the scene and, and being talked about for the UFC. And now we're in the midst of a little bit of a, a week break, I guess, in between regional shows with uh, Clan Wars just around the corner and obviously our fighting championships coming up uh, at the end of July or June as well. Andy, how are things? What's the crack with you? Are you keeping well? I am fantastic. I am. Uh, I'm, it's a busy, busy time heading away now next week. There's, there's, a lot, there's not a lot going on in MMA and, and thankfully so because... Uh, life is life is hectic at the moment. I'm. Uh, That's I'm going, right. Yeah, that... I'm going abroad. I'm going abroad. I'm going to see a man about a dog next week. That's it. We want. To, you don't want to share the news, no. You know. Are you I'm getting it? married. Are you it? Yeah, I'm getting married. Oh, oh, congrats. <laughs> uh, congrats. I'm married next week. I've somehow convinced a human being to spend the rest of their lives with me. Uh, so best of luck to her. Uh, no, <laughs> great, it's great news we wish you both the best uh, and uh, yeah we're recording this a little bit earlier guys and we were supposed to have a guest on the things didn't materialize so that's why we're flying solo this week we'll probably bring back two guests maybe for the next podcast to make up for this one quill chat how are things uh down your end uh big big win for water for last weekend um Kind of a little bit disappointed keeping Limerick in it somewhat, even though Limerick did their own thing. Disappointing weekend for Kenny and the Hurland. It was all go last weekend. A barren time for mixed martial arts and the regional scene in Ireland, but not a barren time for Hurland right now. Some week of sport last weekend, I'm telling you. Jesus, you had the football on, the rugby was on, Munster, unbelievable. They got the heroes welcome back in Limerick here as well. And uh, the GA was absolutely popping as well. Nice to see Waterford get a win because... Uh, it's not exactly been the best starts to the year, to be well, honest. Um, yeah. But you look, you know yeah. the pain. <laughs> oh, you must be used to it now at this stage, I'd say, Quilcha. But sure, uh, it's been like that since I've been a kid now, and even before that, I reckon. So, yeah. Surprised you haven't taken a victory <laughs> lap over uh, Burnley here. Oh, not yet. I actually don't even have my jersey on today. What a shame. Nah, he's only a plastic fan. <laughs> some, some nerve now, you. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> right lads let's get into it obviously we had the uh, premiere episode of the ultimate fighter season 31 which kicked off um last week um we'll probably by the time this comes out be two episodes deep but as i said we're recording early we'll talk about episode one we can talk about episode two maybe three the next time that we go on uh obviously lee hammond brad katona share the irish interest and obviously conor mcgregor at the helm as a coach against michael chandler um andy What's your thoughts in general about the Ultimate Fighter? I mean, a big, big folklore in UFC and, and it coming into the mainstream was the Ultimate Fighter itself, uh, which kind of dwindled away uh, over the last couple of years. And even me, I haven't watched it in, in quite some time. It went away for a while. It came back. They've tried different formats. It's back now for episode 31, I think, back on ESPN in the States, which is a pretty big deal. Conor McGregor as a coach, Michael Chandler as a coach, uh, a lot of hype surrounding that fight as well. But, you know, I think it was the right move to bring McGregor in to try and, and, and rejuvenate it. But after watching episode one, what are your thoughts on the show itself? 
Yeah, I mean, I agree completely that it's a great move to bring McGregor in because there's like people are watching it again. I, I I'm like yourself, haven't watched it in ages. Used to love it. Uh, Tough five will always be my favorite. Um, but this one, it's kind of the same. Um, maybe even worse than <laughs> than in recent years. I don't know, but like it, I think this season will be better purely because of the McGregor and Chandler interest. Um, and obviously from our perspective. Like you're kind of looking anytime you see Lee Hammond or Keen Cowell, your own Roddy, like there's there's Irish MMA interest here. Um and obviously Brad Katona represents an SBG too. So um yeah, I, I'm expecting a lot of the same that you kind of see with Tough, but uh, I'll be watching it. I'll definitely watch it this season. Um and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how it plays out for for the Irish interest in it. Yeah. Uh it's going to be very interesting. Obviously, with Lee Hammond there, we know Quilja who he's going to be fighting. He's going to be taking on Kurt Holliba uh, in the first round. All the fights were announced on episode one. And uh, it's a tough introduction for Lee into the into the tough household against probably one of the most experienced guys in the house overall. Um, uh, what, maybe your thoughts on the Ultimate Fighter too before we actually go in and break down the fights of, of Lee and, and Brad as well. Yeah, like it's been a bit of a... Not, I wouldn't say a dead product, but kind of not one that people have been tuning into as much in the last few years. But uh, what they've done this season is rich. You know, it's good. They got McGregor in. It's, you know, you bring veterans versus prospects, has a bit of a new idea to it, and it's going to bring viewers. That's the best kind of best bit about it. And uh, yeah, I'll watch it. I used to love it, kind of went off for years, but uh, now I can see myself staying up until 3 a.m. every Tuesday watching it. So uh, I guess they've brought me back in somehow. And uh, that's the point of the whole kind of marketing surrounding it, I guess. Do you know what yeah, might be the, like... the, the best part is is the McGregor whiskey slash alcohol empire um, because <laughs> from a professional point of view, it'll be awful um, for, for the athletes trying to stay in peak condition, but it could cause some carnage. Uh, um, Lee, obviously, when we were, we were chatting to him in SVG not too long ago, he was saying, Jesus, you know, some of this will be the first, it'll be the first time I've seen some of this stuff because I don't remember it because I got too drunk. So uh, that could, <laughs> that could be a throwback to earlier years where uh, it could get feisty or, uh, or, or just a bit of crack, you know, uh, it could be fun to watch. What are your thoughts, Andy, on the whole kind of prospects versus veterans kind of um, format that they've gone with this season? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I I like it. Um, it's just look, they're trying, they're trying something right. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure they have they done this before. I feel like they've done this before. Um, but e- either way, um, I, I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's grand. Like it's, it's just a bit of a team. Um, I like the narrative of you know you've got the the guys who we've got somewhat of familiarity with. Um, the likes of a Roosevelt Roberts who we saw in episode one, uh, with a devastating KO. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's you're kind of. You know, spurs spurs the young lads on, spurs the uh, the old lads on as well. Well, not old, but you know the vets, um, and yeah, just kind of pits them against each other. So yeah, I don't think they have done it before. They've brought in vets before, but maybe vets versus vets, where it's like uh, the idea of the prospect versus vets. It makes it a little bit interesting. And, yeah, uh, but yeah, Ru- fucking Roosevelt Roberts looked damn good in his uh, in his opening fight. Um, he beat Nate Jennerman. Um, the way they've gone down through it is uh, we won't see Lee Hammond until probably episode four or five, depending on how many fights they have per episode. Um, you know, maybe they'll double up on fights over the next couple of seasons, but he will fight Kurt Holliba. And we have Brad Katona, who is taking on Carlos Vera in the bantamweight weight class. So, I mean, it's nice to see a couple of the familiar faces there. Owen Roddy, Keen Cowley, John Kavna. Um, obviously Connor and, and Philly Sugcliffe and he's got a good crew and a good team over there with them does Connor uh, getting in and getting in uh, in around the mix as well um, and of course his opponent and his, uh, his kind of rival on the show is, is Mike Chandler it's something that we haven't really talked about yet because there was a lot of uncertainty in the air but now with the announcement of Conor McGregor coming back into the Asada pool, it seems a lot more kind of set in stone that the, there's a good chance of this fight happening towards the end of the year. Um, when you look maybe at Conor and Mike, and I, and I guess, you know, we'll get re- more into it when the fight is probably made official, you know, but uh, overall, what's your assessment on that fight, Quilcha? How do you, how do you see it as a comeback fight for Conor? It's probably one of the, 
toughest comeback fights you can have to to be fair about it um like there's no easy fight in that division he's going straight in with one of the best in the division as well um i'm not even sure of the weight class is it, it there's talks of being welterweight i believe um and if so i that's just mental but either way um very difficult and i think mcgregor will get the fight that he want that he wants out of chandler in terms of chandler will stand and bang and he will tr- and he will throw heavy punches and might work into the game plan of Connor. But uh, yeah, I, it's a funny one. I could also see it going the, the way of a, like the Chad Mendes fight. I can kind of see it like that, but just a weight class or weight, two weight classes above, funnily enough. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good fight for him to come back to, despite it being so tough. It could launch him straight into where he wants to be in tight contention. So uh, just got to wait and see. But uh, I, I love it. I do like it. It'll bring a lot of ice. And uh, yeah, it's time will tell. Uh, the weight class is what I really want to figure out first. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it'll be at welterweight. I, I'd imagine it would be at welterweight. Um, you know, it talks of middleweight or whatever is a, is a little bit ludicrous. But like, you know, I think they'll definitely probably fight it at welterweight. You are you confident of the fight happening? There's been a lot of doubt online. I mean, I've seen Andy. A lot of people talk about Conor McGregor not coming back at all, and I think that's a little bit crazy uh, to be thinking that way. I yeah. think Conor's competitive nature is surely going to see him back in there. Like, I mean, doubts over the Chandler fight are legitimate, okay, but I can definitely see Conor fighting again. I think that's that's like him not coming back is completely out of the question now. Yeah, no, I think he will 100% be back and I think it will be the Chandler fight. I think it's just a case of when. Like, there's no chance in hell Michael Chandler's going to you know, he may have to wait more longer. I don't know if it'll happen this year. I, I maybe next year. Um, and like I, I don't know. You said that a, a bit. The you said I actually had missed that bit. The, the coming back into the Usada pool. I didn't know that was if that's been official yet or. Well, the paperwork has been sent through, and then okay. yeah, what what I'm hearing is that yeah, there it's it's right there now. I don't think there has been an official official report yet. Yeah, but I that's think they're where... aiming to try. And... Go ahead. No, as you say, that's that's one where I'll kind of I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Once I once I actually see it officially reported, then I'll be like, okay, because like there's been it's been talk of oh, don't worry about that thing for a long, long time now. It seems so. Once that's done, look, the clock starts ticking for six months, and or unless you can get a a little loophole or a workaround and, and an exemption to say right, go on, do your two tests. But I mean, you sort of been very vocal in their stance of nope, this is the rules, you're going to follow it. Um, so he'll probably have to wait the six months. I definitely think he'll be back. I think Conor McGregor will be fighting for years to come. Um, do I think the results will, will always go the way they've historically gone? Uh, that remains to be seen. But um, I, I, I'd i be very, very shocked if he hangs up the gloves anytime soon. I don't think he's that type of guy. Like he, if, if he was going to do it, he'd have done it by now. Uh, like the only reason you're in there is for the love of it or for that chase of the feeling of whatever fighting gives him um that's what he's in that, that like that's why he's still going so uh definitely going to be that fight michael chandler is the biggest money fight of his career not a chance he's going to you know take a different fight even if he has to wait an extra six months so he, he'll be hanging around and uh yeah i expect to see them both fighting i don't know if it's the the wisest move i think it's a great marketing a great fight to market but jesus it's a tough fight to come back to it's uh it's a testament to the challenge that that connor looks for but I don't know if I'd be taking that fight if I was him um, coming back, especially off that injury. Mm, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. I can. It's the typical kind of fight that that Connor likes to take coming back. All right, you had your Cowboys as well, which was kind of in a similar enough boat, but where it was like probably just get back in there and get a win. But there's obviously certain things that Connor sees in Michael Chandler's game that he feels that he can kind of take advantage of um i'm interested he's talking a lot about his kicking game now and i'm sure he'll be throwing that leg up and uh, it'll be interesting to see how chandler folded, reacts to that. folded one of his students there <laughs> I so saw that in the clip in the clip so do you think quilcher do you think Connor can come back and get a win against michael chandler early days yeah no no doubt about it to be honest with you um, like, look, there's a lot of factors to come into play here. Will he, what for, what version of him shows up? But I, I, I think he'll come prepared. Um, because if you look at the Khabib one, you know, it's I guess different type of fight, different type of vibe around it. But I do think that this is a type of fight that's he could win. Um, and I feel like he get finished as well. 
Yeah, I can see that as well. I mean, I, but in fairness, Andy, what you were saying as well about Mike Chandler, he can provide some tough tests for Conor McGregor. And I think the big question for me coming into this one is kind of what Mike Chandler are we going to see? Are we going to see Mike Chandler who wants to go in there and, and pick up the win by the easiest means possible for him and the easiest way as possible for him is to try and take Conor down? Or are we going to see the kind of mad bastard Mike Chandler that we've seen in recent fights and that will play exactly into Conor McGregor's hands. And I mean, getting a win over Conor McGregor is one thing, but if you're Michael Chandler and you have the balls, and I think he does have the balls to go in there and stand and try and strike with him, I think that might be uh, the start of his downfall if he does do that. What are you thinking on the way kind of Chandler is is kind of if shaping up? To there him? is anything we have learned from Michael Chandler's UFC run is that he has decided to say, uh, that wrestling singlet there, yeah, never need that again. Uh, give us a pair of boxing gloves and I'm going to go in and throw... Uh, throw hands so like he, he's going in there to bang um I, I think i don't think he should but i <laughs> but i think that's exactly what he's gonna Snuck do looking an odd takedown against dustin poor you though um, yeah and uh, funnily enough i watched you watched back that video uh, in the first round where he hurt Poirier and then went for the takedown. It was like, for a guy who's yeah. abandoned his wrestling, right. he chose You're to right. go back to his wrestling. The worst a possible very, time. very bad time, yeah. But it'll be yeah. interesting to see how it all shapes up. Um, obviously, we're not in the know about Lee or Brad in the show yet. Um, you know, I trying to stay away from spoilers. Um, Lee hasn't given anything away, but he's facing Kurt Holliba first, and he... Uh, 36 year old uh, Kurt UFC veteran um, it's the veteran test that you know you'd probably want for Lee Hammond at this stage of his career isn't it yeah like it's it's easily the most tenured fighter that, that Lee has ever faced so um, you know <laughs> it, it's not so long ago we were we were looking at uh, his fight on Air FC and being like you know this is a uh, kind of critiquing the the level of matchup albeit a, a short notice one but Jesus this is a it, it's a proper matchup right here he's thrown right in the deep end um, but look, from what I've seen uh, so far in Lee's pro career, he's well able for a test like this. So I'm very interested to see how he gets on. Um, I think that Halaba is, is beatable. I think he, you know, he he fought in the UFC a number of times, but I don't think he, I don't think he ever got a win. Um, but he is very experienced, so uh, it's a good, good first matchup uh, for Lee to take on. Um, and yeah, looking forward to seeing it. I don't know, as you said, I don't know when we're actually going to get to see it. Um, so we'll have to kind of make do with with uh, with training stuff. I saw Lee get a nice arm bar in one of the clips in in episode one there, and uh, power move also for Lee to you know they've just they've just gone in, they put their bags in everywhere. Lee goes straight for the avocado. I noticed uh, with the with a bit of toast. So uh, power move uh, in the kitchen there in episode one. Absolutely, yeah. Power move, Quilcha as well, with the bottles of uh, proper twelve there in the kitchen and the Forge Irish Stout as well. Premium preparation there. Um, you think we're going to see some madness there, like we've seen in previous tough episodes or series seasons with the old drink involved? Uh, what what what's the season where we had the Let Me Bang, bro? Uh, what I yeah. Oh, no, if we if we get another kind of season like that, or even just an episode of chaos like that, um, it would just it would make the season to be honest, because that that was just crazy and it made for great television. But uh, I tell you what, it was great marketing, wasn't it? On the on McGregor's behalf, getting forged out everywhere. The caps you see them walking around with the caps, the hoodies, title sport, literally, literally every business venture everywhere. It's absolutely yeah. genius. I, I I noticed it in every scene. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, for Lee's fight though like I just I was looking through uh, the records there Kurt Holliball was uh, <laughs> he was 14 and 3 by the time Lee had even made his amateur debut how crazy is that um, I love it so it's such a perfect test and now we get to see what how he fares against these guys and it, yeah it gets to put the, uh, put the division on notice and the show on notice I love it sure does Um Canadian Irish representative Brad Katona is also in there. Um, kind of a weird setting for him, Andy. Kind of going in there and and you know competing against John and all the coaches that he knows so well, mm. and 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 the coaches that like he knows the coaches well, but the coaches also know him well. I'm very curious to see how that kind of materializes on the show when it comes to you know coaching against one of your own fighters. If you're John Kavna, um, he goes in there against Carlos Vela. 
um, who's coming in, uh, former Fury fighting championships um, contender, on a four-fight win streak. And Brad Catone is probably on a rich vein of form himself. So that's a, that's a good, good fight there for Brad Catone. But I think, for me, the big story is, is how how to kind of decipher between coach and student when you're John Kavner or Roddy mm. or Connor or something like that because it's a weird situation to be in, isn't it? Yeah, and like obviously Connor, look, I think it was very clear his strategy when he was picking. So he's like, right, I'm going uh, 155 prospect because he wants Lee in his team. And then we we saw him, Lee, you know, number one pick as well uh, or, or in his rankings. So I, I'd say he was like, right, I'll get Lee first and then I'll scoop back up and get, get Brad because, you know, he's obviously closer with Lee. But for, for John, it's a tough one because like, I'm pretty sure they've got a very close relationship, uh, John and Brad. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult situation to be in for both of them, but you kind of just have to put that aside. And at the end of the day, like most of the, you know, your work is kind of done already, but it, I guess it is, it's in the fight itself, the game planning. But I mean, Brad's, I mean, Brad won the ultimate fighter before, um, didn't he? So true that, is, yep. Is, his second go around, like he's well used to this type of format. He obviously had a couple of losses, but like his losses are to Marab Dvalishvili and then Hunter Azur, who's who's also in the house here now, um, uh, as a teammate of him this time. Um, but you know, since then he's gone and he, he's picked up the brave title, four fight win streak himself. So I think he's probably one of the the front runners here for for that uh, one thirty five bracket. I think so. Yeah, I feel him and um, what's the guy's name that was in there? Let me see. Um, Timur Valiev. He's an also yeah. really good guy as well. Yeah, I, I, I noticed he was ranked third. I was like, oh, that's yeah. Well, I think that was there, tactics. Maybe. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely gamesmanship because we even having Kurt Holliba as a as a a fourth pick as well seems like the most experienced. Because they must guy. have known, like they must know that McGregor's choosing Lee as his number one pick. So like, I would imagine so. I would right. imagine so. But it'll be interesting to see how the season kind of progresses. Anyway, we'll keep up to date with it here. We'll have a little bit of chit chat if anything happens. Andy, I have one more thing to say about this, and we're missing. We've buried the lead. The most significant moment in the entire episode happened in the last two seconds where poor Keen Cowley was bullied this is a an anti-bullying podcast he was bullied by Bellator heavyweight champion Ryan Bader uh, absolutely hoofed across the cage uh, now I'm told Keen turned around knocked him out right after that cameras didn't catch it but um Allegedly. I would just like to say that that uh, <laughs> as as an Irish podcast we we don't stand for this bullying um, and we don't stand for this so shame on Ryan Bader Keen Cowley who's just trying to keep the peace and uh, and was was viciously assaulted uh, might I ask Try I look forward to you asking Ryan Bader that question the next time he's at Bellator in Dublin yeah no no bother no bother yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you could get I think I'm getting married that day yourself, too <laughs> <laughs> love it love it love it um, the day we are recording here guys marks the 10 year anniversary of Neil Seary becoming the first ever Irish fighter to pick up a Cage Warriors title. On the same night, uh, Cottle Pendred uh, retained his title against Shea Mills. It was Cage Warriors 1, or Cage Warriors 155. No, it was Cage Warriors 55. Nothing, uh, nothing behind that. That was uh, that took place, like I said, 10 years to the day, Saturday, um, June 1st, 2013. Neil Seary is one of the OGs of Irish MMA guys. So real, real solid representative of mixed martial arts in this country. Um, a fighter's fighter. Um, you know, a guy who progressed in his professional career, balancing a normal nine to five job, balancing raising a family, everything like that. You know what I mean? And he was a fantastic representative and got his shine. Um, you know, obviously by picking up the Cage Warriors title, defending that a couple of times and moving on over to the UFC. Um, you know, we post uh, we posted on Severe MMA today about with Andy about, about Neil Seary. Um, and he's just a real, real pioneer of Irish mixed martial arts, isn't he? Absolutely. Uh, a legend of Irish MMA and someone who deserves all the respect and credit in the world. Um, he's one of the the pioneers, the trailblazers that, that have kind of... Um, laid a platform for the current generation of fighters to to build off of and he's just a guy that was really easy to get to get behind you know he was kind of 
seen as this working class hero where like when I like I'm not going to pretend I, I never will that I was around back in, in like that kind of heyday of the golden era when, when the fighters were coming up through cage wars around that time I wasn't following Irish MMA at the time but it was when I started getting into it properly and I found Severe MMA and I was watching the likes of that mini documentary with Neil Seary where he's running to and from work to get his cardio in where he's as you said balancing jobs he's in the warehouse he's and he's just a likable character who there's never any bullshit with him he tells you exactly straight as it is he doesn't try and pretend to be something he's not he has you know he 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 did things the right way he clawed and scraped and fought and earned every bit of success that he had and the fact that he went in there and won that cage for his title. He was 33 at the time as well. So it wasn't like he was a young pup. Uh, and to then go on and have, because like that was the springboard for him to get into the UFC from there once he claimed. And was, and also a trailblazer in the sense that that was the first ever cage warriors flyweight champion. Um, so to, to then, you know, to fight the, the list of killers that he did in the UFC when he's, you know, it's hard to say looking back now, but like you're 33 years old and you're only going into the UFC and you're a flyweight typically that's when you're kind of starting to wind down your career at a, at a low weight class like that. So who knows what he could have done um, had he got in there a bit younger, but um, certainly a, an easy, a fighter that was very easy to get behind, very easy to support. And I think very well respected amongst all fighters in, uh, in, in Ireland really. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I mean, what Neil had to deal with back in the day, Creel show was pretty much a lack of competition. There wasn't that many, you know, 125 pound professional mixed martial artists in the country of Ireland. So it was traveling around and trying to get, you know, lads over from Europe and everything like that. But I feel, you know, lack of competition and, you know, it kind of hindered him in some way. And obviously the fact that the UFC didn't recognize the flyweight division until maybe later on in his career as well. But you know what? Neil made it happen. He went in there, had some good wins inside the UFC and took on some high level competition as well. And I mean, you look at his last two fights, went in there um, and lost a unanimous decision to Kaigo Haraguchi and then lost to Pantoja before he hung, hung up his gloves in 2017 Two like, you're talking about a guy going out at the very, very top there. And I think overall, Neil Seary, I think when you look at the larger scale of Irish mixed martial arts, is a really underrated fighter, Quilty, isn't he? Completely. Um, he was, an, ah, like, I always thought he was an absolute legend during that uh, during the golden era of the Irish fighters in the UFC. Um, very, I, I would agree, very much underrated. But uh, I think as the years have gone on and more people have kind of gotten into Irish MMA, they've learned, they've come to appreciate it uh, and appreciate his career a lot more. Especially you've seen it today. There are a lot of people have been putting up tweets or even just putting message support under the uh, or sharing the uh, graphic that's been made on by Sam on Severe. Shout out to Sam. He's making unreal graphics for Severe. Uh, he made that one today for Neil. But uh, yeah, look on Neil's career. Um, I actually. It's very, very, very blessed to be able to go see him. I went to Rotterdam as a fan. My only, one of the only ever events I went to as a fan, actually. And uh, I turned, I was there, and there was absolutely no one in the arena. And Neil was like the third fight on, I believe. And he fought Haraguchi, one of the best, still is one of the best in the world in the division. And uh, he went out in his shield. He brought Haraguchi three rounds, and he was swinging till the, till the end. And I fucking loved it. Uh, there was probably about six of us in the entire arena singing ole 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 I tell you <laughs> but um, oh yeah no look some career he had unreal yeah and it goes to show Haraguchi fighting for the Bellator 125 pound title to this day as well so no we wanted to give Neil a mention there one of the OGs of Irish Mixed Martial Arts um, we look back there now guys let's take a little bit of a, a further look back but more recent look back and Jordan O'Neill produced uh, an unbelievable win in all my EFC in Barnsley last weekend, securing a first round guillotine. And boy, oh boy, Andy, that must have felt good for Jordan, who has been through the run of the mill in the last little while, um, trying to move to pro, trying to get a fight, having had fights falling out on multiple occasions. He went in there, produced a really good, well-rounded display, looked really crisp on the feet. Uh, boxing looked good, footwork looked good, and then, you know, forced the, the shot. Um, 
and secured the first round guillotine. Uh, I mean, he ticked off a lot of boxes in his pro debut. It was a long wait, but it was worth the wait for Jordan O'Neill in the end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like he, he's a guy that has fought at multiple weight classes, one with belt, uh, amateur belts at three different weight classes. So going in here at middleweight for his pro debut, um, I thought his hands looked so quick. Um, I thought they looked really, really crisp. And he, he, like I, I didn't get to see the full fight, but for, I saw pretty much all of it. There was a clip that I managed to get my hands on. Um, he, he looked ferocious when he was, you know, when it was standing. It was all him, and then it was clinical. As soon as uh, the, the shot came in for the takedown, jumped the guillotine, was successful, uh, and yeah, a clean pro debut for Jordan O'Neill, who, as you said, he hasn't fought since, I think, April of last year, was uh, the fight against Troy Gibson, where they were kind of, you know, that was marketed in Ireland as like, you know, Troy had a bunch of belts, Jordan had a bunch of belts, let's let's see who the king in, in amateur is, um, was then booked to fight on Cage Warriors Belfast, against um, Paddy McCarry last year uh, and that fight fell through so uh, you know great to see him finally making that that walk as a pro um, and he's on a he's on a tear at the moment I think he's won like what six or seven I, I need to look it up now but he's won a good few fights now in a row so uh, definitely one to watch um, a, a nice prospect coming up through yeah you mentioned Cage Warriors so that's where I was going to go with the next part of the conversation and uh, I'll send it over to you Quilche it's like when you're going out there and, you know, putting performances on like that, I mean, you are going to be turning the heads of Cage Warriors. And, you know, with another Cage Warrior show coming up, maybe he'll want to get in there and compete again on the regional scene. But I think for a guy like Jordan O'Neill, Quilche, Cage Warrior seems like the perfect fit for him right now. And maybe we'll have him on just to have a conversation about where he'd like to go in his career. But, you know, he was already booked there for Cage Warriors and it didn't work out. So I can kind of see a path and him with the yellow gloves on down the line. It's the most natural step, really, isn't it? Um, especially if you're putting on performances like that against guys who are as highly rated as Joe Ambler was as an amateur and probably still is as he enters his pro career. Uh, the, the the division, the middleweight division in um, Cage Warriors, quite like it needs depth. It's not exactly the deepest division. Um, they need a lot of upcoming prospects to start filling that division and you know, building it more and he's perfect one to add to it. Uh, I'd love to see him uh, him and Paddy McCarry have a go again, but I'm not sure. Might, you know, we, we want it, we ha- nearly fair, had it once. Fair scrap. But, yeah. I've got, I've got a, a, an uncharacteristic take here. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see Keep them away from each other. Let you, them build. You, you Let them build. Irish fight, no, I know, I know, I know, I know, but not this time. I think they can uh, both, when both it's, great if, tears. if it's early in their career, if they're if it's early in their career, I mean, uh, it would make sense over to maybe the next fight or two, or but we'll see. But I think what, what the hell is going on here? This is usually the opposite way around. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We're after changing <laughs> our tune here. I I don't know, but like when you look at when you look at Ian Gary and you look at uh, James Sheen, who fought early in their careers as well. Obviously, it was their first uh, and Fair maybe point. fights. Maybe, I mean. It doesn't really look at it. It's a shame to see a make the fight. Take make the fight, Ian Dean. <laughs> <laughs> make the fight. Let's do it from one Ian to it, another. I'm convinced. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Didn't take too much convincing, Andy. Didn't take too much convincing, but a great, great, great win for Jer. Sorry, I just happened to think that uh, combat jujitsu is starting to be a gym that's kind of coming up in Irish MMA as well. Obviously, Eamon Dean uh, fighting there. He, he had that win yeah. over uh, Troy Gibson there not so long ago, and you know, yeah, shout out to combat yeah. jujitsu. 100% and shout out to Jordan O'Neill great performance look forward it's a, like I mean I love seeing that you know it's the type of performance that leaves you wanting more and I do and I'm looking forward to see, seeing Jordan getting matched up again pretty soon Um, moving on along across the pond the 11th of August in South Dakota just a couple of weeks before Bellator Dublin James Gallagher returns to featherweight to take on Chris Lencioni at Bellator 298. And there's a little bit to unpack on this first, guys. Quilcha, I guess I'll go to you first. Um, on the 11th of August, just around three or four weeks out from the next the Bellator Dublin show, how are you feeling about James competing? Look, at, it's a strange one. We're, we're, asking, we're asking Irish fighters to get the chance on, on, on US cards and travel across there. And, and we're asking for Bellator to, to give them that opportunity. And we'll see that. We're going to talk a little bit later on in the podcast about Richie Smullen and Karen Moore, who, who get that opportunity in just a couple of weeks. But for me to have James on 
fighting on a US card just three weeks out from from the Dublin card doesn't make it too much sense to me. How how do you feel about that? Ah, uh, it's, it's bittersweet to be honest because I'd love to see him in Dublin again. I think the fans would love it. He'd you know we've been crying out for James to fight in Dublin again again for quite a while now. Last time was twenty twenty one, so uh, it would. It would be br- brilliant, but the opportunity to fight in the States and to continue to build his name there would be huge for his profile for his profile and his career going forward. And uh look, it if it's if it's the only day that worked or it's the only kind of time that worked, then fair enough. Um if he isn't obviously since he's not gonna be in this cur- upcoming Dublin card, if he makes it on the one that is probably gonna be in February, I think that would make up for it, especially if he could get a headline spot because James, the head, he's a main event fighter, really, if he fights in Ireland. So why would you, you may not want to put him in the co-main event and then have risk the risk or run the risk of the crowd being half empty by the time James finishes. Everyone's like, oh, that's it. Bye. See you later. And then I can see why you wouldn't you wouldn't want him in Ireland unless he's the main event. So hopefully they can do that in February. Um, but yeah, nice to see him back. He's up at featherweight. It's uh, I wasn't expecting that move, you know. Yeah, no, that's a it's a good segue, Andy. I'll go to you maybe about the top. Maybe we'll we'll go to the featherweight question next, but maybe your thoughts on the placement of James just a couple of weeks before Bellator Dublin. Yeah, I mean, um, what you mentioned there about you know that we've been calling out for Irish fighters to be getting opportunities abroad, etc. That's very different. There's a distinction. So when we're calling for Irish fighters to get matched in the US, it is the likes of a Carl Moore, a, a Richie Smullen, and, and anyone else who wants to stay active. And it do, doesn't have to necessarily be in the US. It's guys like Kenny Mokunwana who, you know, fresh out of a, a out of a win, he's saying, I want, you know, get me booked somewhere. And then he doesn't get booked. That's that's what we kind of complain about. And, and we'd like to see a bit more activity and opportunity there for Irish fighters, considering there's such a, a stable of them on the Bellator roster. Um, with James, it's different because he's such a household name and his activity has just not been there the last few years. Like he's had in the last three years, I think five um, fights that were cancelled. Now, I don't think they were all, um, that's not a criticism by any means. It's, it's just that we haven't, we haven't seen him fighting actively. Like he, his last fight was in 2021 in November against Patchy Mix, obviously that loss in Dublin. Prior to that, it was a full 13 months uh, previous against Cal Eleanor. Uh, and then again, 13 months. So, you know, we're just not really seeing James active um, or at least as, as fans would like at the moment. And I'm sure James himself, and obviously he's had some in, a lot of different injuries uh, in addition to that. So when he's coming back, finally, I would have liked to have seen him on the Dublin card. Now, what I imagine Bellator, and I, I can't really fault them on this from their perspective, is the Dublin shows are huge attractions. They are they bring media eyes. Everyone wants to see the big walkouts, the crowd atmosphere, etc. So it kind of makes sense for them to stick their champions on there to say, right, maybe this is uh, you know a division that's not getting the shine, or, or, or it is. Um, I feel like these events can make those fights seem bigger um, like the spotlight that was put on the welterweight division between uh, Logan Storley and Yaroslav Amosov and obviously he had an amazing story anyway um, so they're putting the, the title fights that we were we were also calling for at one point but I would have liked to see James especially you know Peter Queeley's coming off a few losses um, Liam McCourt's coming off a loss albeit a contentious decision there isn't maybe necessarily a an outright Irish um fighter where you're like that's the main event but James Gallagher kind of always is that uh, you could have P- Peter Queeley in that spot too but coming off a few losses maybe it's time for you know let him take a breather uh, and see what's next so I would have liked to see James on this card but look I just want to see him active at the end of the day um, I want to see him back healthy back active um, and competing yeah like I mean I understand your guys' perspective of the main event, but you could just easily throw him in as a co-main event slot there, three rounds, and he's come back as well. Um, yeah. You know, take the pressure off. Absolutely. Of, you know, it's a lot of extra pressure, maybe main event and then more media and stuff like that. And, you know, maybe James himself kind of likes a little bit of break from that. Maybe he prefers it, and maybe we'll get the chance to speak with him ahead of that fight too. But, you know, it kind of brings it, and we're on the topic of we got a bunch of fights that were added to the Bellator 299 card, which is going down September 23rd in the three arena. Obviously, we 
spoke briefly about Johnny Eblen, Fabian Edwards. Uh, Brian Moore um, will also be moving up to the featherweight division to take on Otto Rodriguez. Uh, Sinead Kavanagh was announced for a featherweight bout, bout against Sarah Collins. We kind of uh, talked about that the last time. Um, another Irish interest on the card, obviously, we have Nicolo Soli, who's coming in against uh, Roman Debenet. And Kenny Mokohana is taking on Josh O'Connor, two undefeated prospects there too. Grilcha, your overall thoughts on the card so far? You know, not finalised yet, but... To me, and, and keeping on topic, I mean, you throw a James Gallagher fight in the middle of that card and it turns it from a, a good card to a great card, really, to be honest. Yeah, it, well, it would. Um, but so far, yeah, no, I, I'm actually liking the look of the card so far. Uh, Aaron Pico versus Pedro Carvalho. Uh, what it's a fight. that one. That's a great fight. A- absolutely incredible. Um, as soon as I saw that, I my jaw dropped. Uh, they're, they're two lads who fight the who's who of that division. Uh, they are really making a name for themselves in Bellator and they will they've you know they're a fighter's fighter they'll fight whoever is in front of them they'll fight the best of the best and now they're going against each other and I absolutely love it uh, perfect come in event uh, I believe it's come in event uh, and if so absolutely perfect one to have I love it uh, yeah look there's I reckon there's a, still a few more to come with a few more Irish fighters hopefully to be added so be interesting to see how they build this one out even more but either way it's a uh, it's looking very, very good. So very, very tasty card. Yeah, hundred percent, Andy. If you were to, if you were to add, if you were to give, a, if you were to given a, a free reign there now, and you're sure to put on your matchmaker's hat, would there be a fight or two that you'd like to see added onto that Bellator card that would spice things up a little bit? I know I'm Liam after putting me on the spot here. Liam McCord versus Chris Cyborg. Do it. Do it up. Why not? Why not? They're they're teasing it. I think Cyborg's playing a little bit of games here. You know, obviously she's been calling out uh, Katzengano for God knows how many consecutive days. She's buying websites with uh, their names and and trolling and teasing, you know, telling Leah, stay ready, stay ready, Leah. Well, you know, how about we just make the fight? How about we make the fight? Let's give uh, let's give Leah the title shot. Uh, why not? Make it happen. Um, yeah, that's, I like it. stick that on there. I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. So uh, that kind of wraps us up for the Bellator thing um, with James uh, competing and a couple of fights added to Bellator Dublin. And I'm sure there'll be a few more added uh, over the next couple of weeks or months as well. Let's talk a little bit about Octagon Ireland versus England, lads. Kind of, we got some news during the week about that. Um, and it's kind of an interesting uh, kind of a setup, really. We have Paddy Hoolan, we have Shemrock on one side, but and we have Brad Pickett uh, uh, on the other as a coach. Um, and I think what with Paddy or Brad Pickett is with is with two. Who's the other coach with? with uh, uh, a- Akon Wanless. Yeah, and and I think the idea is with Shem and, and him and Akon would be would be fighting at the end of the show as well, along with the contestants. Andy, give us the old lowdown of what you know so far about that. Yeah, so look, this is a it's a reality show called Octagon Challenge. This is it's you know similar to Tough. Um, they have done this. Octagon have done this um, a number of times before. I think this is the sixth season. So they've they've done it in different countries and um, they, they've kind of built uh, a big part of their market as part of this u- utilizing this format. So they're doing it Ireland versus England. Um, they're obviously branched out into the UK and Irish markets now, and they're starting to sign fighters. So as you mentioned, Paddy Hoolan, they're they're kind of going with the, the the veterans or legends of Ireland and England. So Paddy Hoolan and Brad Pickett. Now they're not going to fight, but uh, it seems that they're going with. A, a fight at the end between Shamrock. Uh, now, I don't think that's been officially announced or reported yet, but I do know that they're targeting a fight for uh, Shamrock at the end of it. So I would assume that it's against Akon Wallace. Uh, so that, you know, they, the similar to, to Tough, where you have the, the, the coaches fighting is typically what you, you want a bit of spice to it. And then you've got the contestants. So you've got uh, Matt Elliott, um, Dennis Frimpong, um, Armand Herseg, and Aaron McDonald all competing uh, for Team Ireland. Um, and then on the the UK side, uh, there are a number of fighters that they haven't been released yet. Um, I had a few of their names and I can't remember them now, but they'll they'll be going against them. It's a kind of like an, an eight man tournament, but I think they're going to try and keep you know the Irish fighters on one side, the UK fighters or the English fighters on the other side, and then you know kind of recalibrate. I imagine after each each thing, I, I'm not entirely sure how that works, but they're they're filming over in Bratislava at the moment, um, and it's set to air later in the year, and then it'll culminate in a final. 
night in Manchester where there's also a, a kind of like a reality element where there's a comedian um, fighting a Jake Quickenden, who I believe was on, I don't know which singing show, one of the singing shows in the UK, but he's been training at Team KF, I believe as well, um, a little bit. So um, yeah, so that they'll be fighting. I think Paul, so I can't remember these two lads' names, but Paul... Uh, um, something the called the joker um yeah two lads fighting who, who don't usually fight are going to fight in manchester so that's the, I guess the big <laughs> the big question is quilcher do we uh, are we adopting shamrock now as one of our own he's uh, representing ireland as a coach there and going to be fighting ireland versus england um what, what's your thoughts on all of that and the tournament as a whole ah, he trained in dca there for a while so we claim a lot of people. We might as well claim another. Sure, why not? Um, he's uh, he, he's from Liverpool, but as the saying goes, Scouse not English. So look, we'll, uh, <laughs> the Republic of Scouseland can uh, they can we can take one from there and uh, bring them over to Ireland. Uh, so yeah, no, we'll ha- happily claim them. Um, I think there's a it's a good old team. I mean, I think it'll be good. Good laugh now. This tournament, some good yeah, personalities on it. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they're thinking a little bit outside of the box. I love an old tournament format, and you can't beat the now age-old rivalry of Ireland versus England too. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I was talking. We were, we were all talking with Harry Williams there, and you know they have to fill out a twenty-one thousand seater stadium here, so or arena, not stadium. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if they can do it. They've been doing it over. Uh, in mainland in Europe, uh, in Czech Republic, they've been filling out those stadiums. They've been putting on some fantastic shows. It'll be interesting to see if they if they capture the imagination of the Irish and the, and the UK fan base when they bring that show over there. Um, when when is the finals and everything kind of kicking off, Andy? Do we have any details on that just yet? We do, and I'll pull it up right now. It's in um in 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 in. Did I have it on here? Maybe I didn't. Um, we do, but I can't remember when it is. So September, I will have to it's in, so, it's in September to, sometime. The finals. Yeah, it's in the AO Arena or the OA Arena. Which one is this? The AO OA. Um, uh, November. No, it's not until November fourth. Oh, so it's for, it's a good while away. AO Arena in Manchester, England. Yeah, so I I imagine that the show will probably come out in the autumn, and then you know, however many episodes, six episodes or something like that, and then it'll it'll culminate in the final, so. 100, 100%. Uh, before we move on and take a look at some of the upcoming fights, um, just uh, we won't say Jamie Adder, but Bissett and Senen Coakley representing Team Rhino. Uh, we're unlucky enough, they bo- both lost over at UKFC um, recently as well. So look at these things happen. The boys will be be back on. Senen and, and Jamie have been... You know, you're always getting entertainment when you see the two boys fight. Anyway, some wins and losses happen at amateur, but we said we give them a shout out anyway. They were fighting over there, unlucky not to get the win. Um, and let's move over to a little bit of a preview. Uh, we'll start closer to home first. Clan Wars 47 goes down um, pretty soon on June 10th, I believe it is. Um and we have a couple of good fights on a quiz. June, June 11th, June 11th, June Sunday, 11th, Sunday, June 11th. Excuse me, excuse me, not on the Saturday, it's on the Sunday. So June 11th, uh, Jordan Fury, uh, who was on with us last week, he has an opponent now. He's going in there against Gabriel Marcelo. Uh, a couple of other highlighted fights, Matisse Zaharoff versus Dara Toman. That's a great fight too. Dara Kelly is back in action against Andre Ferreira. Uh, Shane Mullen will take on Damian McKenna. That's kind of the best of uh, the lot. Obviously, we have a couple of other guys. Shea Cleland is fighting on the card. Sarah Elliott Sheridan is fighting on the card. Lots and lots of fights to look forward to on Clan Wars. Quilchell, I'll send it over to you. Uh, what are some of your highlights? What are you looking forward to seeing on that card? Plenty. Uh, the debut of Jordan Fury is obviously one that I'll be keeping a very close eye on. It's... Uh, he was so good at amateur. It'd be very exciting to see him in four ounce gloves and uh, using those heavy power that he's got in the hands uh, in the pro ranks now. So that'd be great to see. Uh, Derek Kelly, naturally, I think he's going to, I think he'll be far too much for this lad he's going up against, but it'd be still good to see him get in there. Now, the highlight for me is Derek Tuman against Matty Saharovs. Uh, these two lads met before. It was Derek Tuman's pro debut and Matisse was 1 0 at the time, I believe, uh, with Matisse getting the win and moving to 2-0 at the time at Runic, choke in the first round. So, 
Dara has now got uh, the opportunity to get get that win back. Yeah, he's on a two fight win streak. While Matisse is on a two fight loss streak. Um, great timing for the two of them to meet. The belt is on the line. Uh, very well. It's it's a really well matched fight as well, and it's one that you could see in a promotion like a Brave, uh, FCR, Cage Warriors. All these you could see it in one of those. But no, it's he- it's it's on in Clan Wars, and fair play to them for putting that fight together. I think it's a uh, it's a top matchup against two really good prospects. I have to give them credit, Andy. I mean, they they have put on a really really good card here with some fascinating fights from from top to bottom obviously we've only shared the highlights and some of the, the the professional fights and stuff like that but you know we have to give credit where credit was due clan wars have put together quite a good card here yeah absolutely and, and this is the type I, I think this is the type of fight that you want to see the, the Tommen versus Zaharos fight uh, I want to see these types of fights in Irish MMA I know uh, literally as we were saying earlier on I, I flip flop and said nah let's not put them together you know you can have these early pros going against each other and, and cutting their teeth and and uh, there's a bit of a storyline there as Quilch mentioned you know the fact that Saharov's won the first fight but Toman's the one now with the belt uh, and, and you know he'll have to come and take it off him and you know to- Toman's kind of been active he's he's on a streak Saharov's is on a losing streak he hasn't been yeah, I think this is his first fight since December 2021 so you know, this a nice bit to cut their, your teeth into here, and yeah, Clan Wars doing a, a good job generating interest. This is definitely, you know, the, the most interested I've been in in one of their shows in uh, in some time. Um, I'm very, very interested in this one. Um, so you know, anytime you can have pro fights at the top of the card, I think it really adds something to uh, to an Irish show. So um, yeah, hats off to them. We're all for pro fights on the regional scene here. That is for sure, and it's good. Fair play to Clan Wars. Obviously, we'll talk about we're fighting championships on the next episode. They have a show coming up too. Uh, we were going from a quiet period into a busy period for the summer as well when it comes to regional mixed martial arts. But uh, we'll finish off today's show by, by taking a look across the pond, and that's the upcoming Bellator um, card, which is headlined by uh, Vadim Nemkov and Yoel Romero, Bellator 2. 297 in Chicago, Illinois, but we have some Irish interest on the card. We have Richie Smullen, who's coming in to take on uh, Timur Kizriev, and we have Karen Moore, who's coming in to take on Alex Polizzi at 205. Uh, let's start start with Richie Smullen uh, versus Timur Kizriev first. Uh, Quilja, tough, tough fight for Richie here. This uh, uh, Kizriev, undefeated, very well rounded Russian, uh, looks like to be an explosive striker. Um, and I'd be very interested to see how Richie can kind of handle his style. I mean, you know, you know what you're going to get when you're getting the Richie Smullen fight. That's a, a gritty, hard, fast paced, all action fight. And I can see this being exactly that as well with both Kizrev and Richie Smullen kind of fighting on the front foot. Uh, uh, they both like to fight on the front foot. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. It's an interesting stylistic clash, isn't it? It really is. Um, they, Richie's taken some seriously tough fights in his return to Bellator. That Piotr fight originally was like beforehand. We were saying how, you know, how tough fight fight that was, and now he's getting Timor, who's very high, highly touted. I've seen that uh, a guy I know who'd follow Russian MMA quite closely is very high in him and was high in him before uh, Kizriev got into Bellator. So, from what I've seen him, he looks. <laughs> scarily good uh and a win against daniel Weichel is highlights that even if you go back further what to when he was in burke young eagles in the tournament finally he beat biber tumanov who is a serious prospect he was one i would have watched in a few or uh, a while back a few years ago um so look he must be from the clips we've seen and the people he's beaten he must be a serious pro- prospect and uh, a very tough opponent who could do it on the ground or on the feet but he's got his work cut out for him and Richie Smullen like Richie is as tough as they come as you said so uh, yeah I'm expecting this to be a bit of a war now to be honest I mean we, we all had a look at Kizri Andy before um, you know we recorded here today and it was like you know one thing that definitely stood out to me is the explosiveness of his strikes and I think it'll be up to Richie to do what he does best and that's close the distance and try and get um, his opponent on his back and, and and kind of go to work down there as well. He did it so well on his last fight, and and that's what he does best. 
Uh, and I think that's going to be the be all and end all of this fight. It'll be, you know, if, if Timor fancies himself on the feet, you'll want to keep it standing. And I'm sure Richie will want to try and, and, and drag Timor into deep waters, make him work off his back and kind of do what he does best and drown in his opponents. That's what Richie Smullen loves to do. Be very, very interesting to see if he can do it against Kizriev in this fight. Yeah, look, Kizriev looks to be a very well-rounded fighter as well. And, and as you said, um, you know, it's it's going to be a tough fight, uh, but it's it's a fight that um, look. I, I think this is a great opportunity for Richie as well. Um, when when he went into that Nijelski fight, it was the same as when Pedro went in, where it's like there's high risk, little reward. But the there there is a reward clearly here because Kizrev is I think ranked eighth in the in the rankings there. Um, so you know he he's got a number next to his name. There's an opportunity here. Um, Richie obviously coming off a split decision win as well. So it's kind of the, the matchmakers are probably saying right here's a, an undefeated serious prospect. Let's see how you do here. Um, and if Richie can can put that kind of grinding pace where he just doesn't give you an absolute inch. Um, I think that'll be his his method of uh of success here. Like to to basically put Kizrev on the back foot, don't let him get out of first gear uh, and just smother him and and put on one of those grinding, grueling, um, top-heavy pressure performances with some ground and pound thrown in and, and some sub attempts. Um, and yeah, look, we, we that's kind of Richie Smullen's bread and butter. Obviously, he's been working uh, with some of the high-performance coaches from from the Irish boxing team and stuff as well. So he has been working on his hands. Um, but, you know, Kizriv is is very competent there too. So look, it's a tough fight for Richie. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and I'm very interested to see how he does here. Yeah, yeah, top stuff. Uh, it's great. Like you said, with Quilch just said and Andy said it well, it's a tough, tough fight. But those are the fights that Richie wants, you know. Um, you don't want to be to be messing around too much and fighting. At least we see a pathway for Richie Smullen here. And that's more than we can say about a few Irish fighters currently in Bellator, where, you know, mm. some are at earlier on in their career. But a guy like Richie, who's been there before, this is his second opportunity. You know, we have to give credit to the look at it. it's a tough match, but Bellator are matching Richie good here, uh, it, giving him a chance to fight into the rankings as well. Um, but like I mean, yeah. you're not going to have easy fights at this stage or, or at this level in Bellator, one way or another, Andy. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the other thing I say is I think Richie is deceptive. Like he's not the flashiest strikers. He's not. He doesn't have the prettiest uh, style of fighting. Let's just say, but it's effective. And like if you speak to anyone in SBG. It's the amount of fighters who've told me that he's the toughest round, that he's the most like just horrible teammate to go against in a not from a, in any bad way, but in just the it's it, you're miserable, you're miserable when you do rounds with them. Um, the, a lot of people have told me that, so I think he Richie's style is quite deceptive and and effective, um, even though it may not be the flashiest. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's he will start at a pace and. We've seen a lot of fighters that are able to start strong, but they'll slowly fade away. But Richie doesn't. He can maintain that level and the pace and, and that grinding kind of grappling style that he does, which is like an absolute nightmare to deal with, especially when you're on your back. You can't get back up. Um, I'm very curious to see. I feel that this fight is going to be is going to be won and lost based off who can kind of dictate where the fight goes. I mean, Richie, as we said, will, will probably want to take the fight down. I think Timor will be looking to kind of keep it standing and land these big shots, but great, great fight. And uh, one that will happen um, early enough on the fight card too. So I'm really, look, that's a great card overall. We have Norbert Lavigny Jr. on that card as well. Higo, uh, Mihailovic, um, lots of good fights on yeah, the undercard card. here. Yeah. And Carl Moore will head, well, uh, I'm not sure exactly where he will be. It says here that it will headline the prelim section uh, against Alex Polisi. And I mean, talking about opportunities for Richie Smullen and fighting into the rankings, well, Carl Moore is already in the rankings there. Um, and he will face Alec, Alex Polisi uh, for a chance to enter into the top five in the uh, like heavyweight division in Bellator, really, if not further up, if he has a good win, depending on how they, they structure the rankings there, Andy. But this is a, a big fight for Carl, a huge opportunity. You know, the plan the plan was set in place by John Cavanagh. He said it was. Uh, this will be his third fight uh, in quick succession. He's moving on up the rankings. This is a fight where we, we thought with his last fight didn't make too much sense, but this one does against Alec, Alex Polisi, who himself has had tough times. You know, we haven't seen him since the old Romero fight. 
But I mean, he went in there and showed his toughness against Joel Romero. And behind that toughness is a very, very skilled fighter here. And it's not going to be an easy fight for Carl Moore, but it's a fight I do believe that Carl can get his hand raised in nonetheless. Andy, what's your thoughts overall? I agree. Um, look, Carl's coming off a, a fight where he probably didn't fight to his potential um, or, or to his ceiling, and he would say that himself. He, he did say that himself. Um, but I just think of, of the fight that he had against uh, Carl Albrechtson and the heart and the guts and the skill that he showed in that. And I think that he is, you know, he has some serious potential in this Bellator 205-pound division, and this is a brilliant opportunity. It's uh, I think we've... We, we we've definitely talked about this match prior to it being uh, done. I think Ian, you did a, a card as well with Sean Sheen, uh, where you kind of like a fancy one. I, I can't remember w- which podcast it was, but we've talked about Alex Polizzi being a, a suitable next matchup because we're we're looking for what we're always screaming for is the continuity. And not only does he have a uh, a fighter who's ranked fifth at the moment uh, to go up against here and can take his spot, but he's got two other light heavyweight fights on this card, and one is for the title. So while Vadim Nemkov and Yoel Romero, that's probably you know he's probably not going to fight either of them next um but he could potentially be fighting one of Corey anderson or phil davis so if he goes out here gets a win and just gets on the mic uh, and calls his shot he could easily be in a big fight next time out maybe we'll see him brought back to uh to dublin you never know even if he if he got went in here and got a uh a quick finish or didn't take too much damage for all we know we could see him again in september in dublin um, and that could set up a huge fight for him. So um, a brilliant opportunity for Carl Moore. And I, th- I think it's one that he can absolutely take with both hands. I think uh, he can go in here and beat Alex Pellizzi. Um, But again, tough, tough fight, but um, a winnable one. Yeah, definitely is. Like you mentioned the Magic Rosansky fight for Carl the last time. And maybe I'll send it over to you, Quilcha. I mean, look at like Andy said, not his best performance, but you don't always have to go out there and prove your toughness. I think he did that against Carl Brexton. I think, you know, Carl's performance was a necessary performance is that I always say it's better to win ugly than not win at all. You know, the win will always be there on your record and you can't, you know, in a guy where we talked about this time and time again, a couple of Pedro fights, a couple of, you know, even you could talk about this with Brian Moore's fight coming up against Otto Rodriguez, where it's a, it's a tough fight against a non-known name. And that's what Carl had to deal with against Magic Rosensky in his last fight. And, you know, you, you can't be too critical of Carl. He went out there and got the job done against a very, very tough opponent, Quilcha. Completely. And as you said, it's just about winning at the end of the day, get your money, get the win and progress. That's, especially in a risky fight like that, which he, which he took. So he's now been, I've, well, he's now got the fight. He's, he's earned, deserved. And yeah, if that win got him a massive opportunity that could launch himself up the rankings and maybe not title contendership, depending on how the other fights play out, but it could give him the biggest fight, his biggest fight of his career in the likes of a, a Phil Davis or a Corey Anderson. Um, because I can't see who else he fights if he wins, to be honest with you. Uh, maybe the loser of the title fight. Who knows? But uh, yeah, it's fantastic to see he's, the way he's being built and progressed by Bellator. I think it's, uh, it's a really positive sign and uh, something really promising for all the other Irish fighters in the roster as well. Yeah, 100%. Like, I mean, it's probably uh, on purpose that I, I would like to think that it's on purpose that he's on the same card that v- v- Vadim Nemkov and Joel Romero are on as well. So, I mean... To be fair, uh, John Kavanagh did did say there's a plan. There's a plan, so maybe yeah. this is the plan. And that's he what you want to be doing. Joel Romero after the main event. There we go. You never know what may happen. <laughs> I'd love to see... This is what I would love to see happen. If if Carl goes out, gets the win against Alex, you match him up against Phil Davis as your co-main event and the Dublin card. And if he wins that, you'll have him fight for the light heavyweight championship in Dublin next February. That's my plan. I don't know about what John's plan is or what Carl's plan is. That's what I'd like to see anyway. And I think that, I think fucking hell based off Carl's skill set and, and the way he's been looking lately, I, you can't doubt that happening really, to be honest, it's a real, real good chance and it's exciting. And another chance, you know, another Irish fighter that's in the mix for a world title here. We've been blessed this year with the kind of way things have structured out in the Irish MMA scene that we have a lot of fighters in, in with a shout for a crack at the title. And it's, it's very, very exciting to see any final, final thoughts guys, before we wrap it up for episode 33. The weather is beautiful. 
I'd say I'm <laughs> melting here. That's a real Irish that we're keeping to our Irish. Kind you're of off to year. you're off to Vancouver. Ian. That's right, heading over there next week for UFC 289. Yeah, I actually when this comes out, I'll probably be over there. So yeah, looking forward to getting out there. Yeah, and yeah, uh, with the fancy new camera. The fancy new camera is coming over with me. We'll be properly set up. We don't. We won't be dealing with any rinky dink setups over there, lads. We're kind of go give it the whole hog. Try and get a bit of content done. I don't know it's a nice. It's a nice experience for me, and I am looking forward to it. And yeah, it should be good. It should be good. I'm excited to see a couple of live fights again. I jeez, I love like I just love watching live fights. It was. Going to see the nationals and getting to do the commentary there with you lads was well, we, just you nothing more than the first life. live fights you've seen in how many years at the nationals? Uh, I I had said it was a long I had said it was a long time, but I actually had forgotten. I thought it was the first time since two o two, but I had since gone to two o six in Toronto, and I had went to an event Amanda Nunes and Valentina Shevchenko, which was actually That's the last. A while ago, that like. Yeah, it was a good while ago. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, the scene over here in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan yeah, in general yeah. is not that good at the minute. You're going to have to become the Don King of uh, of Saskatoon MMA. <sighs> Jeez, I don't know. Just, just treat fighters money. like absolute shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Grow, grow the hair up and I'm going grey already, so I'll have a little bit of Don King going on here. So, um, yeah, no, it'll be interesting to, to see. I guess I'll uh, do the card and we'll be great. break it down. Yeah, it's good, good old experience. So uh, that what wraps fight, us up what next fight are you time. looking forward to the most, Dean? Oh, oh it's got to be Benil Darius versus uh, Benil Darius versus Charles Oliveira. The co-main event is is a cracker of a fight, lads. It's unreal. I can't wait. And I'm assuming and I, you'll be wearing your uh, your L Triangle jersey, spreading the gospel uh, through. We'll bring it over. We will bring it over. We will spread the good news and we will spread the word. Uh, shout out D- to Dana, uh, uh, Ian O'Neill from the Out Triangle podcast. <laughs> uh, you better fucking know I'm going to be asking Dana White about a, uh, a show in Ireland if I get the chance to. And uh, I'll yeah, definitely. When are you signing Paul Hughes? When are you signing Reese McKee? When are you signing? 100%. Let's put, the, Let's put the bug in his ear, as they say. Let's put the bug in his ear. But yeah, that's it. We'll. Uh, We'll leave it for here. And Andy Stevenson, you will be a married man the next episode. So I we will. wish him all the best. Um, fair play to you, Andy. Um, we wish you a really good time. Um, and uh, congratulations in advance. And uh, Thank yeah, Quilcha. Yeah, Quilcha. I'll leave it to you, good sir, to see us out. Well, look. Good night, lad, Andy. I guess uh, Maris can all slam the fall.